Um, so, I, well, I guess I'll give my normal spiel in case anyone online does not usually attend this uh, seminar series. So it is a venue to discuss new tools, technologies, and methodologies that are recently developed in development or um, just of interest and use uh, by researchers. Um, so today we have Craig Rohr, who's going to give us an introduction to Wicca. Well, thank you, Marcy. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. My name, as Marcy said, is Craig Bewer. I am a second year in the bioinformatics program here. Um, and so when Marcy asked our lab to give a talk, um, I was trying to decide, you know, what should we present? And so a lot of what I use is um, sort of more MATLAB or Excel, but then I've used this program called WECA a couple times, and I thought, well, I hadn't heard of it before, and I didn't know um, sort of how ubiquitous it was, and so I decided, why not just give an introduction on WECA, because it seems like a pretty cool software. So just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of this before? Oh, wow, okay, a couple of you. So this is going to be sort of an introduction, so nothing exciting, sorry. Um, so what is WECA? Well, WECA is short for uh, the Waikato Environment for Knowledge Analysis. It's a the Waikato University or University of Waikato is in New Zealand. Um, it's an open source software uh, released under the GNU General Public License, um, and it really, at its core, it's a, a collection of machine learning algorithms. And there's um, a lot of ways that you can then take those algorithms and apply them to your data or run scripts. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Waka is also a flightless bird, as pictured here, that is endemic to New Zealand, but that is not what this talk is about. So, sorry. Um, so, uh, the idea of this talk, I think I'm going to uh, give a bit of background on sort of what machine learning is, and then we'll sort of talk about um, what Waka is and how it um, makes use of that. So, machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, and the main idea behind it is that given some data, some set of data you want to sort of look for and extract and, as the name suggests, sort of learn patterns inherent in this data that you can then use to sort of um, apply to other sets of data. There are a couple different types of machine learning. Um, the two types I'll talk about today are supervised and unsupervised. Um, and then within each of those, there's a bunch of different types of algorithms. So there's things like Bayesian networks, decision trees. Um, I'll talk about support vector machines and what those are. Um, <clears throat> but there are other um, types of machine learning that I won't go into. It's a huge field. Um, but really, like I said, sort of what it boils down to is you want to generalize from experience. So given some set of data, some experience, the algorithms try to learn about that and then apply what it learns to new instances of similar data. So one of the types of machine learning is called supervised learning. And in this, your data set, when it is given to you, is labeled. So you've got each entry has um, some sort of label associated with it, whether it's a class or an instance. Um, <clears throat> and what then happens is you take this data and you split it into two sections. So there's training data and test data. And so the training data, what it does is it looks at this and it takes it as input and it also looks at the, the label associated with each entry as the desired output for the algorithm. So it, looking at this training data, it sort of infers some function that it can then apply to the data that will generate the desired output. Once it's got this function that it thinks like, okay, this is a pretty good function, then it runs it on the test data. So it, you give it the input and it computes the output using that um, inferred function and it then checks that against the label that was supplied. So that way you know you can get sort of a sense of accuracy um, specificity, things like that. Um, and one of the ways it does this is it's called cross-fold uh, cross validation. So it'll take this data set and it'll take, you know, nine-tenths of it as training data and another t the last tenth of it as test data. And it'll run it and try to come up with some function. And then it'll do that again and again and again with different chunks of the data used as training data and different chunks used as test data. Um, and once it's done with all of that, it sort of, um, sort of uh, averages your, the functions that it came up with and uses that as its sort of best estimate for just a general supervised learning algorithm. Then what you can do is you can give it new unlabeled data and it will run the function and based on the output it says, you know, this is what I think um, the label should be. And based on its performance in the test data, you can have some sense of accuracy. 
unsupervised learning um, is kind of, I mean, it's still machine learning, but in this case, the data aren't labeled. Um, so you're looking for some sort of hidden structure or something you don't quite know what it is. Um, generally, it's more for clustering. Um, in this case, there's really sort of no right or wrong because there are no labels with which to sort of base your ideas. Um, so one example is if you have a bunch of data on tumors and you've got size and growth rate for these tumors, um, you know they're all cancerous and you're just sort of maybe trying to classify or cluster these different types of tumors. So when you plot the data based on size and rate of growth, you can see there's sort of four clusters. There's one here, 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 and here. Um, and so there are small tumors with a slow rate of growth, small tumors with a high rate of growth, medium tumors with a medium rate of growth, and large tumors that grow slowly. And so those are your sort of four classes that, that some unsupervised learning algorithm might generate. Then what you can do is you can say, well, I have this tumor uh, sample, and these are, you know, say it's 800, the size of the tumor is 800, and it grows at 4%. So then, you know, it would be somewhere around here, in which case you could say, well, maybe this is a class four and it's related to these other types of tumors. That's sort of the general idea behind unsupervised learning. Like I said, there's no labels, so you can't say these are, you know, class one, two, three, four, and am I right or wrong? It's just sort of more of a looking for hidden things or trying to find um, things that aren't necessarily readily apparent. So one example of supervised learning um, that I'll talk about, or demo later, is uh, support vector machines. Um, this is, like I said, a sort of an example of supervised learning. And your input data has to be set up so that there are two classes. There are um, sort of extensions of this algorithm that can use more classes, but generally you work with two. Um, you kind of can't tell, but some of these dots are blue and some of them are red. Um, most of the ones down here are blue and most of the ones up here are red. And so what it does is this algorithm tries to make a model. Um, and what it does is it treats all your data at points in space, whether it's 2D space, 2D space, some sort of high dimensional space. Um, and once it plots this data, it tries to sort of draw a line through them such that the margin between the line and any of the data points is the largest. And any data on one side is in class one, and data on the other side is on um, the next class. So in this example, like I said, most of these are blue and most of these are red. So what it's done now is it's drawn this line, and it says anything on, underneath the line is blue and anything above the line is red. There are a couple red dots below the line and a couple blue dots above the line, but that's to be expected. It's not going to necessarily be perfect. Um, and so once you've got this model done, then what you can do is you can give it new data and be like, you know, here's this point and it sits somewhere around here. And so then you can say, well, more than likely it's going to be a blue point. And if there's a point up here, you can say, well, it's probably a red point. And so that's sort of the idea behind um, support vector machines. So now we get back to Weka. What can Weka do? Well, it can do a lot. Um, <clears throat> the first thing you can generally do with Weka is data pre-processing. So you've got your data in some format and you want to be able to run uh, some machine learning algorithms on it. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you can use Weka to sort of import your data and get it into a format that you want then to be able to apply to these algorithms. Once that's done, it's sort of, you know, the world is your oyster. You can do different types of uh, data classification. Um, there's generic, multi-instance. There's, uh, you can do text, da uh, text data mining or text classification. Uh, there's been recently some additions of cost-sensitive data or cost-sensitive um, algorithms that you can use. Um, it does various clusterings, associations, so looking for sort of, again, uh, relations between your data. So if, for example, if you had a bunch of recipes, maybe one of the associations it would find is if there's eggs in a recipe, there's likely also going to be milk in that recipe, for example. It, you know, it'll try to find associations within your data. It does regressions. Another nice thing it does is attribute selection which means that if you take um, all your data and if you've got a lot of input values and you don't know necessarily which ones are useful and which ones are just kind of, you know, uh, something that can be thrown out without much consequence, um, you want to use attribute selection. So, for example, if you've got, you know, 2,000 genes um, and you want to say, like, well, what are the 10 most important genes in this study that I'm running? It can do that, too. There's a couple different ways it can do that. Um, it can just do some native stuff, meta classifiers. It can just do a straight filter. Um, 
It's also, they've recently added some time series analysis to this. Um, I haven't worked with that really too much, so I can't speak to how good it is. Um, but one of the really nice things about Weka is that it can also do data visualization. So once you've pre-processed your data and got it into some form, you can visualize it then. Um, and I, will, I can demo this later. Um, but it also lets you, once you've run your uh, machine learning algorithms, it will let you sort of plot the results and you can see sort of where your data points lie and how they've been classified. Another nice thing about Weka is that it's extremely uh, extensible. It's written in Java um, and it's open source, so you can get at the source code whenever you'd like. And you can then, obviously, if you have some uh, method that you've developed or that your lab has developed and you want to um, sort of get it out to a wider audience, you can implement it in Java through Weka and um, post it and just be like, here, you can download this and install it. Uh, Weka now, in the newest version, has a, uh, a, pr a project manager sort of thing, so it lets you download um, extensions that other people have posted. It comes with a large um, group of uh, out-of-the-box algorithms, but if you want to add more to it, you're more than welcome to. So how do you use Weka? Well, so it's, like I said, it's Java-based, which means it's platform independent. So you can use it on Windows, uh, Macintosh, Unix systems, whatever you want. As long as it runs Java, you can run uh, Weka. The default file format in Weka is this ARFF, which is an attribute relation file format. Um, and I'll uh, go into some more examples of that later. That's a default file format. That's what it likes. That's how it reads in the data. You can also give it um, CSVs. And that's fine. There are a couple other um, files you can use. You can connect it to a database. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you how to uh, work with a CSV. The only disadvantage to that is you can't necessarily, it sort of reads it in as best it can. Whereas with the uh, ARFF file, you can actually tell it what is what. There is a command line interface that has the full functionality of Weka. Um, but there's also a GUI, which is pretty nice. Um, and there are four aspects to that GUI. There's the Explorer, which is what I'll demo later. And that's kind of really the, the meat and bones of uh, Weka as far as sort of explored, exploring your data. Um, and then there's an experimenter, uh, this knowledge flow thing, and a, a simple command line interface that are all sort of built into this GUI. So what is this ARFF file format? Well, like I said, it's attribute relation file format, and it's uh, Weka's default file format. Um, there are two sections within this file. There's a, a header section, which is where you sort of put all of your information in a data section. Um, anything with a, a percentage sign in front of it is a comment, so you can document these things and um, put in comments. In your header section, you've got the name of a relation, so sort of what the data set's about. And then in that, you then sort of um, you list all the attributes of that relation. And so that is kind of your templating your data almost. Um, and so you can have the names of, you have the name of an attribute and then its type. Um, and you just sort of have a list of those. And then that's a template for your data, which is then used um, in this data section. Hey, Brian. Oh, sorry, Mike. Oh, you're fine. Um, so in the data section, then each row is, an ent is a data entry. Um, and it's all, it's just, comma separated uh, values, there's one entry per row. Um, and so you've got your header, your data, and then just all of um, what follows. So this is one of the example files that they had on their website. So the first percentages are um, just comments. Uh, so Linda McMahon asks, where can I find link for past recorded talks? That's ncibi.org. Um, so. I think that answers her question. So, um, so right. So this this file format percentages are comments, and so that's just kind of this is a an iris plant database. This is just the example they had up on their website on the Weka website, created um, by these people. So there's the sources, um, and so if we look at this, then we can see okay. So the relation it's an iris relation because it's an iris plant database, and each <clears throat> relation then has a set of attributes. So in this case, there's sepal length. Sepal width, petal length, petal width, and then class. 
And the way it works is, so here's an attribute, this is its name, and this is its type. So these first four are all numeric, which just means that it's a number. Um, there are other types besides numeric. These are nominal types. There's also uh, integer types, which are just treated as numeric. Same with reals. It's another type, but it's treated as a numeric. There are string types. Um, so if you want to do text mining or text classification, you can do that with Weka. Um, there's date formats. That's a, uh, a little bit more complicated. There's also re a relational attribute that's sort of being added in slowly. It's kind of a new feature. Um, I haven't really used it that much, so I can't speak too much about what it is. But um, so it kind of prioritizes, um, you know, first order connections with other things. Yeah. So you can like you can tell say like this attribute is related to this other attribute, or this class is related to this other class. It's not. It's still sort of in development. That's kind of one but of it the. Could be uh, useful for ontological. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is something that they're working on, and I'm sure that people will want to take advantage of it. Um, but, and like I said, I haven't really used it that much, so I don't know too much about how it can be used, but um, it is an option. So um, <clears throat> this last attribute called class, then, is a nominal attribute. And what that is, is it's a set of sort of classes for what each entry is going to be. And so in this case, you've got three different classes, all comma separated, um, Iris Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. I might be butchering those, so I don't know. But um, So th that's your sort of set. And every data entry in the data section is going to be one of these three things. If it's not, your data file is not properly formatted, and so it won't work. Um, so this is the header section then. And then in the data section, um, now we can see that these are all just comma separated. So this first one has a sepal length 5.1, a sepal width of 3.5, a petal length of 1.4, and a petal width of 0 0.2. <clears throat> and so, and it has a class of iris setosa. So these are all the same class, but that's fine. And so, this is what an ARF file looks like, um, which you then feed into Weka. You can also have something called an XRFF file, which is an XML-based extension of the ARFF file. Um, they tend to be larger. I would show an example, but they tend to be a lot larger as far as sort of the uh, opening header part goes. Um, because of that, people would tend to gzip them. Um, and sort of the people behind Weka realize this, and so now you can load and save gzip files automatically. It works the same for ARF, but I think it, the, it began because the XRF files were bigger. Um, you get a couple extra things with this XRFF file. Um, First, you can do class attribute specification. So if there's some attribute you want to specify for an entire class, you can do that with this uh, XML-based uh, extension. You can also do, if you want to have weights for your attributes or your instances, you can do that in here. Um, and so there's a, a bit of syntax for that. But you can put in, you know, this attribute has a weight of 0.9 versus this attribute, which only has a weight of 0.1. That you can do with the um, XRFF files. Same thing with instances. If you have multiple instances and you want some to be weighted more than others, you can do that with this XRFF file. So going back to now Weka and those four buttons, the Explorer I'm going to demo after this talk. Um, and so that's kind of, like I said, the meat and bones of this. But there are three other things that you can use in Weka, the first of which is this experimenter. And what this does is it sort of lets you um, compare and contrast different algorithms. Um, you open the window and you can um, load in your data sets and you can load a bunch of different algorithms that you want to run on that data. Um, and this can be the same algorithm. You can iterate over parameter settings or you can iterate over one parameter or multiple parameters, whatever you want. You can do multiple different algorithms. You can do a combination of them. Um, it, it's basically sort of like you're planning how you want your data to be analyzed. Uh, there's significance testing built in. Um, and this is this is sort of a fire and forget way of doing it. So you load in your data, you load in your algorithms with all your um, variables, and you just sort of press go, and you can walk away. But depending on what you've loaded, maybe you go get coffee and come back and it's done, or maybe you go home and come back the next day and it's halfway done. Um, you can sort of work with that as you'd like. Um, so that it's, it's a pretty nice feature. Sort of related to that is this knowledge flow idea. I don't know how many of you have used NIME before, but it's kind of the same idea. It's a, a workflow generator, and it's a, a GUI for that. So 
you can drop in nodes, like here's a data loader node, and then here's a data processing node, and you connect them, and you tell them how to connect, and all that sort of stuff. And so if you've got a really long or complicated process with a lot of branching and different um, analyzing steps, you can create one workflow and save it. And then you can load it again later. You can send it to a collaborator and have them load it. It's really quite nice. Um, like I said, it's useful for long, sort of more complicated, intricate projects where there's a lot of steps of branching. Um, and that's just straight up a workflow thing that's tied to um, the sort of core functionality of Weka. And then there's also a simple command line interface. It has all the functionality that you would get from a terminal. So I don't know why you would necessarily use it unless you were scared of terminals. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, it's it's pretty just like here's a terminal. So yeah, right. So now you do, and so now you can download a GUI to use a command line interface if you want. Um, but I don't know necessarily why you would. So. <laughs> um, so right, so. Why should you use Weka? Well, it's pretty straightforward and easy to learn, I think. Um, I haven't been using it that long, and I kind of can find my way around as, um, as best as I think I can. Um, there is a, a huge range of um, different algorithms, both supervised and unsupervised, just all types of learning algorithms. Like I said before, if you want to write another one, go right ahead. You can send it to Weka, and they'll um, post it. It has a lot of potential uses. Like Brian said, you could maybe use it for um, cancer research. You can use it for flower database. You can probably use it for birds. Um, you can use it for tons of genomic data. The stuff that I'll demo later is actually um, uh, gene expression data. Um, and so there's just pretty much... Well, to evaluate machine learning. Yeah, right. So anything that you want to use machine learning with, Weka can do that. It's got a great GUI. Um, it has a little memory manager um, that with a garbage collect. So if there's a memory leak, you can get rid of that. Um, and it has great documentation, even built into the GUI. Um, you can, you know, if there's some algorithm and you're like, what does this do? You can click a button and it tells you what it does. It gives you um, sort of the syntax for using it. A lot of people do use it, too. So if you sort of come across a bug, you can send it to them. It's still being developed. If you, um, <clears throat> if you have a question that's not a bug and you just want to know how to do something, you can ask someone. They might know. You can Google it. If it's not there, you can post something online, and someone is likely to answer it. Um, well, so I would add to this, and it's related to what you just said, Scott. But it's an international community. It's coming along. It's in mm -hmm. the open source. You know, uh, and there's an active base of users, and yeah. the thing is evolving and getting better over time. And this is developed um, in New Zealand, even. Right. So it's just, it is an international so, community. Yeah. So that's, I would add that, you know, the list. I mean, the, you know. Yeah. Mm -mm, not anytime soon. And they're, like I said, they're still developing it. There's a couple different versions. Um, the one I'll demo is sort of the newest one, which has an, an extra feature that's pretty nice. So, um, and so with that, I think, unless in the, they're... In the workflow feature, I think it's unique. Yeah, no, I, I don't use that necessarily because I'm not there yet, but it is something that um, I've done a bit of stuff with Nine before, and I think... Yeah. You can really sort of visualize you where you, yeah, you can. And then one other thing I would say before the demo mm -hmm. is, going too long, is that um, back to this uh, trusting out things that you were mentioning, Jack. I don't know how many of you are aware that this really impacts on bioinformatics research a lot. And that is that um, there's a lot of pressure right now coming from the federal government, NIH, and so on. And, you know, it was pressure, frankly, that came from industry about the reproducibility of our work. You know, that uh, you're probably aware that there were um, some studies at Amgen, J&J, &J, and other places where they took X number of nature cell and science papers, 50 to 100 of them, took them into good GLP labs and tried to re reproduce the work and, you know, really couldn't uh, often. You know, less than 20% success rate on reproducibility of you know, basic to clinical mm -hmm. translational science work a lot with a lot of informatics. And so what the government, and that's devastating. I mean, if you can't reproduce a paper, you know, especially a tier one journal paper, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And so the government is now coming back and saying, well, 
you have to be more explicit in your methods section about your modeling and your statistics and all of that stuff. And that's where Weka could really help mm -hmm. because oh, you yeah. could lay out alternative models ahead of time and evaluate right. them. And, you know, that might become a standard in and of itself. Yeah. That's and all it, I wanted to say. It's possible. Right. And like you said, if you have this workflow, you can even just sort of take a screenshot of that and be like, here's our method. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes it really easy. And especially if you're collaborating with people, it's really like you can save and load workflows. So you can save a workflow, send it off to your collaborator. And, exactly. So So that that's an I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a really sort of diverse program, so. Yeah. Okay, that was my idea. So, yeah. Right. I was going to, I was going to ask, is there kind of an upper limit to the data you can put in, like an A, A, oh, sorry. Is there an upper limit to the size of the database that you can put in? But you mentioned you're going to, you're going to demo gene expression data, and that was the example I was going to yeah, give. Yeah, so. yeah, so, um. So yeah, the gene expression data that I have is actually, it's, there's 62 tissue samples and there's um, 2,000 genes um, and then a class. So it's not necessarily like terabytes of data. According to their website, WECA Still can, there. yeah, no it is. Uh, according to their website, WECA can handle uh, big data, but I, I don't know what their definition of big data is. Um, and well, so, maybe, uh, Marcy, you can invite me and we can have that discussion right here. <laughs> what is big data? What is big data and what isn't it? You know? Yeah. Uh, Uh, we can have a discussion about that. This is an important topic, you know, just from the point of view of uh, those, uh, many, many of you are trainees, uh, you know, and uh, it, it's out there, and this part of big, about big data is true, and it's connected, obviously, to analytics, that there's probably um, 10 times more jobs in this area right now out there than there are people that can do them. And that, you know, the other thing is that at least around here, uh, you know, it's a unit like this and folks like you that are um, recognized and frankly it's expected of this unit to be the kind of the place where big data and analytics are done. So it's just, it's just frankly an opportunity. And, you know, there are some things that just are hype and then die away. But the thing that will keep the big data thing going over time is the uh, uh, the obvious growth of the of, of the data sets over time in all domains of work. Social networks. Yeah, and so one one other thing to think about here, and uh, this is a term that I think we all have to be uh, work, knowing about in bioinformatics, and that is data science. So have people heard of data science? Well, okay, so let's, that, that's good because you know. Let me, let me put it this way, our provost and the folks downtown have, you know, and uh, largely because uh, there are data science institutes uh, being established, including here at the University of Michigan. Uh, several were funded by a recent gi uh, gifts from the uh, competitive, on a competitive basis, by Gordon and uh, Betty Moore Foundation and the Sloan Foundation, one at Berkeley, one at NYU, and one at uh, University of Washington in Seattle, data science institutes. We're setting up one here. So what is it? So if you think of bioinformatics as, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, mix between the quantitative, so you'd have mathematics and statistics and, uh, you know, the quantitative uh, aspect. And then you think of uh, the computer science and algorithmic aspects, including, you know, uh, the science of databases and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you think of... Uh, the thing that makes us bioinformatics is this quantitation slash computation merged in with biology and biomedicine. Huh? It's bioinformatics. So the informatics part is the quantitative, statistical slash algorithmic component, computational mm -hmm. component with data and information, and the application, <laughs> biology or bioinformatics. Data science is instead of the biological application, just put your, ad so the top part's the same, but the bottom part is different. You could have, for example, a transportation institute version of data science. What would that mean? Well, we've got all these Google cars going around the street, and then there's some big database uh, for <laughs> Google cars, and there's some analytics to figure out how it all works. And so, you know, there a data science institute would take, you know, those fundamental, and you know, this mm -hmm. Weka thing would be yeah. right in the middle. Of it. Yep. These fundamental, you know, enablers that bridge the um, 
uh, mathematic, statistic, and um, algorithmic, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, this, yeah, this is all machine with learning. With the application, and then plug in your favorite application. And, you know, and then uh, what you have is a generalization of the concept of informatics, which is now being called data science. So we have to know about it because they're going to ask you. And ultimately, and I will make this prediction right now. Well, I'm looking at you. I mean, uh, you know, that there will be in this room, you know, uh, you know, several of you, five of you, ten of you, will lead data science efforts before it's all over. Maybe even in the next five to ten years, it's going to happen. So something to think of food for thought. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, right. So big data. Um, and to that end, too. Depending on your data size, some of these algorithms will take longer, um, which is why you maybe want to filter your data first, um, depending on what you want to run. But this is a very important point because data is simply that, you know. So I mean, you can tell how long it's taking to run, um, and if you want to read about, <laughs> if you want to read about the um, the algorithm, you can. Um, so I was using one um, algorithm here, and you just sort of Google it, and you can find the paper that was published um, on the algorithm, and you can read about it and how long it takes and stuff like that. So there's data available, certainly. If not straight through Weka, then um, it's not far away. So. But. Right, so this gets into the, why don't you start the demo, this gets into the whole thing that, you know, to go from data to, if you want to create knowledge, which is what we're after, you can't do it with data. That's done with information. And really, you know, we're in an informatics department. You know, it's like the genome. How do the, how do you get the genome to be useful? You annotate the thing in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're talking about. Yep. And so this pre-processing, scrubbing, all this kind of stuff has to be done in a standardized way to turn right. the data into information, including right. annotation. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. So there's one more new term I'll ask you about. I was just reading about it last night. This is a hot one, okay? Data wrangling. Anybody ever heard of it? Good. Well, yeah. I'm glad you've heard of it because that's what we've been doing for the last month. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and not it's bad when you're sitting in the laboratory and you know you find out, oh, what have we been doing? And, you know, and you read a RFA from uh, NIH and it's like we're data wrangling. So Alex, what is it? So basically, by this term, it's often uh, denoted the whole process from getting data uh, to the stage where you start to process data. All the pre-processing, exploratory analysis, cleaning up, reformatting in the way you want to have it, all these steps are included in data wrangling. Reformatting. Yeah. What's the, so how do you differentiate data mining from okay, data wrangling? Excellent. Uh, I would say that data mining is a, you know, data wrangling is a precursor to data mining. And so what we've been running into in the laboratory, which Alex is living with, is, you know, when you have a process like you're going to see in WACA, you know, data is, raw data is over here, and boom, 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 you go like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, you want to go from, say, uh, you know, ultimately in our case, we take a picture. We render the object of interest, uh, you know, it's a nuclei to start with or a chromosome territory. You render that. Then you get into a case where you, you want to measure something inside, maybe even as simple as the volume. And then, you know, that's done with another uh, uh, algorithm in your chain of the pipeline. And then there's a reformatting step. And then Alex over here can tell you. Then you know, oh, are we going to turn that into nifty files? Not that I know what a nifty file is, but I hear these guys are actually, what you guys have been doing in the laboratory is called data wrangling. It's getting the data into the appropriate format as you go downstream mm -hmm. to ensure that the process of moving from data to information and the information is appropriately put together so that it could be analyzed in some kind of uniform way. And so if you have a lot of streams that are coming in to aggregate, you know, the term is called wrangling. It's a brand new one. Check it out. Yeah, that was the earlier term. <laughs> okay, Craig, we better start the demo. <laughs>
Yeah, so, right, That's so. Good, good discussion. So when you open Weka, this is what you see. Um, the command line interface, like I said, is really just a command line interface. So, uh, so uh, one of the cool things with Weka, like I said, is you can, there's a memory usage bar, so it tells you how much memory you're using. Right now we're not using any. And you can garbage collect in case there's a memory leak. So that's kind of nice. Um, when, you first when you first install Weka, you, um, you, like I said, you get a whole bunch of sort of built-in functions. But if you want to add more, you can. And so this is um, new to Weka. This is not like the newest version, and it's the package manager. I mean, so these are all things that people have released and things that you can then use if you want to. So uh, em imputation, all this sort of stuff. So one of the things that I talked about was the um, SVM modeling. And that doesn't quite come standard. There is a, a little mark for it. But if you try to run it, it says, you know, there's an error. We can't find it. And so what you need to do, um, if you come down here and find libSVM, Somewhere. I'll just look for installed. So you find this libSVM. It's a classification thing. You just select it, click install. It takes care of dependencies for you, everything like that, and installs it. I had a previous version of Weka, and I tried to um, to get this. I downloaded this and tried to put it where I thought it should go, and it worked, except then it gave me a different error. So um, if you download this, it worked fine. Um, you can install, uninstall, and so, and like I said, there's a ton of stuff. And if you want to write something, I would guess that you could probably get them to put it up here. Um, so that's kind of nice. That's with the new 3.7 version. So um, now if we want to look at some data. So let's, if we look at, this is um, the gene expression data that we're going to analyze. So there are 62 tissue samples, um, and it's all just, gene expression data. So there are 2,000 genes. And at the end of all of this, this is a CSV file. At the end of all of this, there's genes 1 to 2,000. There's a class. Negative 1 means it's uh, cancerous, and 1 means it's just normal tissue. Um, and so if we come into Weka and we want to look in the Explorer, so this is the window that you get. And you start off by opening a file. So if we go into Desktop. It's not an ARFF file, so we have to load a CSV file, and we're just looking at um, our data. And so here it is, all 2,000 genes. <clears throat> and you can see how each one is sort of, it bins each one. Cool. Um, and if we come down and look at our class, since it's a CSV file, it just reads everything in, since they're all numbers, it reads everything in as numeric data types. But we know that this last one should be nominal, right? Negative 1 is sort of cancerous, and 1 is not cancerous. So the first filter we can apply to this um, will turn this, um, this particular entry into a nominal data set. So we come into filters. <clears throat> it's a uh, supervised, unsupervised attribute. It's unsupervised attribute. And it is <clears throat> numeric to nominal. So now the default is it just it applies it to everything, but we don't want everything to be nominal. We just want the last one to be nominal. So we can get rid of that. If you want to know what it's doing, you can click more, and it opens up some information about it, including where it is as far as the Java path goes, what it does, how to, the different options for it. Um, and this is available for pretty much everything, um, capabilities just tells you sort of more about it, the attributes, minimum number of instances you need to run, and stuff like that. So we would just want to apply this to the last, this last function, and so we'll click Apply. So what it does is it goes through then, and now if we select this, it, has, it knows that so it's, classified. It's, it's classified the tissue as cancerous versus not. And so it's binned as negative 1 and 1. And then if we look at all of our other data, it has now colored it so you can see excuse me, how many um, Entries in this particular bin are cancerous versus non-cancerous. And you can, it won't plot all 2,000 of them. I think it plots 100 at a time. But so you can look at all of your data, and you can see immediately if something's jumping out at you. is like, wow, there's just blue on one side and just red on the other. That must be something um, that would be a good indicator of whether it's cancerous or not. And so this is what our data looks like. Um, it's all just bin. These are all 2,000 genes. This is up to gene 100. Um, so that's, that's sort of the pre-processing step. We've now we've read in our CSV file, and we've classified it. 
So <clears throat> now what do we want to do? Or we've sort of pre-processed. So now what do we want to do? Well, let's try classifying it. So like I said, there are a ton of different classifiers. There's Bayes, there's functions. This is our libSVM, so let's run that one. Um, tells it where's to go. Crossfold validation, let's do 10. Sure, there are plenty of more options, um, which we won't sort of screw around with. But um, you just click start, and it starts running. And while, while this bird is turning, that means the <laughs> algorithm is running. And you can see down here what it's doing. So right now, it's building a model for fold 4, 5, 6. And so it's running, and it's telling you what it's doing. There's a, a log file you can open that just sort of lists everything it's doing. So now it's done, and it's classified everything as uh, A. So it didn't do that good of a job. But um, you get out sort of what it's some statistics related to the algorithm itself. So it correctly identified 40 of them and incorrectly identified 22 of them. And then you get some statistics, uh, true positive, false positive rates, precision, um, and then just sort of your general um, confusion matrix. So that's how you run uh, libSVM. If you want to do... A so that you've got a starting point there. So how do you go to the next step and kind of refine it? As far as... So, yeah, so you want to increase the... Uh, So you can, you can run um, with, you can increase your cross-validation. Another thing you could try to do is you can do um, select attributes, which is what I talked about earlier. We've got right now these 2,000 um, genes, but maybe some of them are useless or maybe some of them are counterproductive. And so we can choose an attribute evaluator. Um, and then if we run this, what it'll do, and it sort of takes a while because there's 2,000, but what it'll do is it'll list like, these are the attributes that are sort of the most significant. And so then if you want to apply that filter to your data, you can pull out just the attributes you want. And so then it'll run faster, and it's sort of cleaner data. Um, so it's sort of data wrangling, right? You're pre-processing it and getting out just the, uh, the, in this case, just the genes that are sort of ranked highest in terms of relevance to what your desired output is. So. That's one way to go about it. You could also, like I said, you could increase your cross-fold validation. Um, there are tons of options. I don't know what half of them are um, uh, for this particular one. You could try running a different method. Um, there are obviously a lot of options. And so if we were to run, say, a, <clears throat> a random forest, tenfold cross-validation again, sure, it's done. Um, and it did a much better job. So it correctly classified 35. It, it, well, it correctly classified, what, 43, and incorrectly identified 19. Um, so it did better. Um, and it, again, it tells you it classified a lot of them as um, cancerous and not too many of them as um, not cancerous. And here's all of your statistics associated with that. If you want to go back at any time, you can look at, um, it, like it saves the output. So at any time, you can go back and check and see sort of what has been done. Um, and again, this has more options associated with it. Uh, clustering is pretty much the same idea. Um, there's different clusters you can use. Start, and it'll do its thing, and it's done. So it's got its clusters, but that we already knew. Um, association is, again, you know, if you've got milk in all your recipes, then you know eggs are coming next. So um, selecting attributes, like I said, this takes a while. But we can narrow down that 2,000 gene file to something with 15 genes and run that, and it'll be faster. Um, and then for visualization, then, um, it's kind of hard to see. Oh, wait, that's not what I want, I want this. So now it lets you plot on your x and your y axis any of the 2,000 genes or the class. So in this case, you're plotting class versus gene 1, and so all of the red dots are up top and all the blue dots are bottom because you're just plotting either negative one or one. And so that, you know, doesn't mean too much. But you can come through and look at all of your data and just sort of see how sort of gene 5 is related to gene 1,661. And so here's your data. If you want to zoom in on that, you can. You can select a rectangle to zoom in or a polygon or whatever and say, like, I want to zoom in on this area here. And you click Submit, and then now it's zoomed in on that area. Um, so this really gives you a chance to sort of visualize what it, the data is that you have and how it works. And if you want to reset, you can come back here. So is there a, okay, so just in terms of getting data out of WACA and mm -hmm. then into something, 
into something else. Right. So um, I think once you've finished with that, I don't actually know um, how that works. I know you can save data, and there's a log file associated with this. Um, with decision trees, I know you can get the decision tree out of it, um, so you can know how it's working. With this, though, um, you can get the instances that have been classified as one or the other, but really, past that, I don't know how much you'd want out of the algorithm, because um, a lot of it is sort of black box stuff. So that so. brings up the point, because that's a dangerous word in our field, right. black box. And, um, you know, so in order for us to really be able to use the algorithms, it, we've got to expose them. Right. I was assuming that and it's all, in the open source. It is, yeah, it's all open source. You can look at the code for the algorithm if you want, and see what it's doing. Um, but at least with that this... Might be, that's still kind of tough. Though. Yeah, no, I mean, so, I mean, um, where it's, it's all sort of hidden away and stuff like that, but like I said, it's open source, and this is a Windows machine, so I just downloaded the install file, but... Well, that was kind of my, my next question. So, um, sometimes you could see that the, it would be pretty computationally intensive, I mean, mm -hmm. depending... Mm -hmm. I mean, is there... Um, does this run on somebody's cloud and come back, and then could you run a local version? I mean, how does that work? So this is all local right now. You're running it right I'm now. I'm running it right on my laptop. Machine. Yeah, right. and so and it's doing fine. Um, you can use the, uh, the experimenter to sort of, this is the one where you load in your data sets, and then you load all the algorithms you want to run, and you click go. Um, I'm sure you could farm this off to a cluster um, if you had one available to you, or otherwise you can That's just... That's why the command, yeah, for example. Um, and so, and you can use this from other programs as well. It's all, it's like I said, it's just Java. So if you've got Python, it's kind of hit or miss sometimes. Um, you can have it, um, if you use uh, Jython, like some sort of Java implementation in Python, you can have it call this stuff. Um, but again, it's kind of like Python in particular, it's sort of like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but if you've got code that you can run Java with, you can run Weka in that code, and then if you want to farm that out somewhere, you can. Um, this, like I said, is just running on my laptop, and unless you have huge amounts of data or you have huge amounts of algorithms you want to run, like if you want to test a thousand different entries mm -hmm. for one That's single parameter, yeah, you can farm it out. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, Alec. Yeah. Because I know why Brian is asking this thing. Because we are using, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, we are using kind of um, the instruments that are support exactly uh, cloud computing and remote access. So mm -hmm. I was asking if there are configuration for this tool that supports actually client server model that you start your job on a cluster, let's say, and you, as you said, you go home and you have your tea and you, and you want to just log into the some I don't know web interface and to see the progress current progress on your job? So I don't know. Okay. Um, I haven't ever had to use a client server version of this. I don't know that one exists. Um, you could remote back into your machine and check and see how it's doing. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I can't answer that with confidence. So yeah. Um, yeah, because sometimes it's like we are working in a big group and there are a lot of collaborators and it's, it's good to have a possibility to share your progress to other people. Of course, you want you want you don't want to give them SSH access to your machine. Right. Right. And so, for something like that, I would say sort of the workflow, um, the knowledge flow thing is useful because you can sort of generate this workflow. Like this is how we process our data, and you can save it and send it off to your collaborators, and then they can load it up just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as they have the same data that you have, you can use it that way. Um, and if they have their own cluster, they can do that as well. Okay, so. and uh, also I know that the guys who are authors of this software they started a, a online class on on this Weka like yeah. a month ago, something like that. Oh, okay. Did Did you look at that? Not really. Um, no. I've I've watched some stuff on YouTube and like read around mm -hmm. in the documentation. There's there's a lot. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah, I saw um, some YouTube. yeah. A lot of people um, will just run little tutorials on YouTube on just intros or like sort of more advanced stuff. It's, you know, there's not, you know, millions and millions and millions of hours of this, but there is enough to certainly get your feet wet and get started and start playing around with it, okay. so. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, guys, any other questions? Narcy? Craig, you got something. Okay.
Great. This is fantastic. I mean, you. just in terms of your own work, I mean, maybe you said this from the very beginning before I got in. I mean, you know, so, something you need to invent. <laughs> Sort of, yeah. So the stuff we have is, like, our project right now is trying to classify um, sort of efficacy of diets. Okay. And so given a bunch of sort of um, clinical data, can you determine, and, like, given clinical data and given success or failure in the end of whether or not they lost weight, can you determine um, just by, this is with, yeah, with Chuck. Um, and so given that, can you determine whether or not you're going to be successful just by your initial doctor visit? So that's how we've used this. Yeah. 